Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. Let's uh, try this again. Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I was a little late getting in here tonight because of expressway traffic. I apologize. But it seems that we got the, uh, the the stuff ready to go into the show on the road. Don't let it happen again, all right? Well, Charlie, I'm going to... Does anybody mind foregoing the announcements period tonight? Yes. No. 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 All right. We'll have the brief announcements period. Then we'll let our speakers oh, speak. Yeah. 30 seconds, that's it. We'll have afterwards a question and answer period. And then our... And then we'll have our infamous rebuttal period. Let's introduce our speaker tonight. How African Americans experiencing higher education. In America, access to and success is in higher education is often seen as the most viable path to class, cultural, and social improvement. Unfortunately, different populations tend to have contrasting college experiences. Through this discussion, we will explore the shared lived experiences of American, African American students, faculty and administrators in the nation's higher education institutions. Conclusions from this discussion will point your way towards racial and socioeconomic equity within America's colleges and universities. Rob DeWitt Scott is a student success specialist at Moraine Valley Community College in Palos Hills, Illinois. He received his doctorate in education leadership from Chicago State University. DeWitt is also an instructor at Sister Jean Hughes Adult High School, a high school formerly for incarcerated adults in Chicago. He has also developed and teaches a class called Black Male Leadership to inmates in the Chicago Cook County Jail in Chicago. Currently, DeWitt lives in Chicago with his wife, Cecilia. Let's welcome Mr. DeWitt. All right. I'm going to grab it. Good evening, everyone. Hello. Uh, first, and I think I will be back for more because this looks <laughs> pretty fun. Um, <laughs> it is. I also, challenging. I also <laughs> want to say uh, thank you to. Uh, my advisor, my dissertation advisor, when I was at Chicago State, uh, Dr. Oh, yeah. B. Young, and so in the back, uh, over here. she is the reason why I'm Good. here. Thank you. Her and her husband, Peter. Uh, they invited me because they felt that I should share some of this research and some of the things that I'm going to talk about today. So I thank them, and I thank you all for allowing me to be here and, and sharing your space. Okay. Um, so to get right to it. How African Americans experience higher education. That's a very broad topic, all right? Very broad topic, so we're going to try to talk about it um, as efficiently as we can, understanding that we can't cover it all, but these uh, particular aspects that I'm going to cover tonight, I think, are very pertinent to, to the topic. <laughs> So, no problem. So first, I want to begin with the understanding of the black experience in higher ed and how it began, okay? Obviously, uh, as blacks came over here as slaves, education was essentially against the law. Reading was against the law. Education was not a viable option, right? So when it came time for blacks to participate in higher education, it had to happen first and foremost through historically black colleges. Okay. Yeah. Blacks are not allowed to go to the <laughs> traditional colleges that were created, the Harvards, the Ivy Leagues, these uh, large state institutions did not accept blacks. So black colleges were formed. All right. The definition, the textbook definition of a historically black college and university, or as we say HBCU, right? any college created before 1964 with the express purpose of educating black people. All right established primarily by Northern white missionaries, yeah. religious organizations, <laughs> Northern white missionaries, religious organizations, the Freedmen's Bureau, all right, and federal land grants, okay? The whole goal of these institutions and these people who started these, these colleges and universities was to come south 
predominantly South, all right, and civilize and educate the new free black slaves, all right? That was the goal. Um, at the same time, blacks understanding and seeing that they had never had and, and access to education felt that having education, being allowed to read, being allowed to write, being allowed to grow intellectually would be the first step to gaining freedom, all right, financially, economically, socially, and so, so forth. All right, that's the textbook def definition. First HBCU, first historic black college created, Cheney University in Pennsylvania, all right, the first private university, Wilberforce University right in Ohio, not far from here, okay, created by the African Methodist Episcopal Church, okay. The African Methodist Episcopal denomination is the first independent black denominational church in America, all right, created in the 18th century in Philadelphia. Be that, that being so, by being the first independent black denomination, it would be the organization that creates the first private HBCU, okay? Most of these schools, these black schools, started as... Try it again, sorry. Oh, that's why. I just forgot a damn tripod. Shut up. Yeah. So, so break the sound. So we, right, we're good. Right, we're good to continue. Okay. Uh, as I said, these schools, these black colleges, historically black colleges and universities, they started off mainly as normal schools or teachers' colleges. All right, with the idea of taking blacks who wanted to go to college and making them teachers so they could go back into K-12 schools and teach the newly, newly free black people, okay? Uh, from that point, with the land grants, with the Morrill Act, start to have more agricultural and mechanical colleges, or what's called A&M, all right? When you have Alabama A&M, Florida A&M, these agricultural and mechanical colleges to teach blacks industrial education, how to work with their hands, how to work in the field, masonry, carpentry, things like that, in order to earn a living. HBCUs are responsible for creating the first black middle class in America, all right? To this day, HBCUs produce almost 50% of the black teachers in America, 60% of lawyers, 75% of black people who hold doctorates, all right? 75% of black army officers, and 80% of federal judges and doctors, okay? So if you see or if you come across most people in these high level professional fields, most of them have roots in a historically black college. You good, Tim? Yeah, I'm good. I just need to back this off a little bit. Yeah, we're good. I'm sorry about all the trouble, my friend. No problem, no problem. Okay, we're good. Okay. So with that sort of contextual background about historically black colleges, how does that connect to where we are today? All right? The biggest shift, the biggest change came in 1954. Brown versus Board of Education, court decision, okay? Brown versus Board of Education outlawed the notion of separate but equal, all right? Something that blacks knew all along. There was separate, but there was no equality, okay? Once 1954 came and separate but equal was outlawed, slowly white schools began to let in black children, all right? Most of the time when we talk about separate but equal, we see it from an elementary school and a high school lens, which is true, that's predominantly where it started. But it also had a major effect at the college level, okay? These white colleges who barely let black people in before, after 1954, they felt the need to start to let more and more black people into their colleges, okay? Also, before 1954, before the Brown ruling, all right, blacks could not could not work at white colleges. You could not teach, you could not be an administrator at a white college, all right? So once Brown came and slowly more and more black students started to come in, these universities started to get very few, a small trickle of black faculty. But prior to 1954, some of our best and brightest scholars could never set foot, all right? Never set foot on a, on a white college campus. W.E.B. Du Bois, arguably the most productive scholar of all time. All right, Alden Morris has wrote a book about him and his history, saying that W.B. Du Bois was the first sociologist, the first academic sociologist in America, 20 years before Robert Park and the University of Chicago and our higher Park people, all right? Never could teach at a white college. He taught at, he, I'm sorry, he taught at, at Wilberforce, and he taught at Fisk. That was it, all right, uh, and a few others. So now, 
after Brown, yeah. after the Brown versus Board of Education, a racial demographic shifted, yeah. all right? In 1950, 90%, over 90% of black students attended historically black colleges. By 1975, 75% of black students attended largely white colleges. In those 20 years, there was a major shift all centered around the 1954 separate equal uh, unconstitutional ruling. I have a chart here to sort of uh, give some sort of uh, graphic about how this has changed, all right? Black students at PWIs. We use the term PWIs, which stands for predominantly white institutions, okay? That's a U.S. Department of Education term, all right? And it is used to signify certain colleges. As you can see, 1960 to 1965 to 1970, all right? The issue with so many black people shifting to the predominantly white institutions is at the very outset, these predominantly white institutions were taking the best and the brightest of the black students, yeah. all right? Understandably so, but it left historically black, black colleges with those who, were, uh, who didn't perform as well, who were not as successful academically, all right? Which put HBCUs somewhat in a hole because now they're dealing with a less prepared, less or a lower achieving student usually. But they're often compared to the predominantly white institution, which takes the, the, the best and the brightest of all races, all right? Not exactly an equal comparison. So now we get to the 60s and 70s. We jump forward a little bit here, all right? In the 60s and 70s, slowly more and more black students are allowed on campus at, at Harvard, at the Yales, at the Cornells, at the University of Chicago, all right? At UCLA, at the University of Michigan, University of Illinois. Slowly there's a small, not a lot, very small, influx of black students. Mind you, 60s and 70s, the pinnacle, the center of the civil rights movement, all right? There's never been a time when what happens in society has not affected what's happening on campus. And, and most times, it's actually been the opposite. It's where on campus is where it begins, and it affected what's happening in society, all right? So the civil rights leaders, which was, I mean, the civil rights movement, which was led by college folk, college students, right? Students on campus are affected. The black students, the, as few of them that there are, they start to look around and say, we are here now, but there's nothing in the curriculum that even represents who we are, our history, or our interests. That has to change, okay? So black students began to push for uh, inclusion of black studies, <coughs> Africana studies, African American studies, okay? A lot of black students, 19, 20, 21 year old, don't even know their history, don't know where they come from, all right? Don't know, have any connection to who they are. 60s and 70s and said that must change and it must start with our educational institutions. That led to the push, uh, the push for black studies, all right? Black studies started to become a thing on, on campuses. And of course, the next step for students is if we do have black studies, now we have black studies departments, black studies uh, uh, classes, assignments, curriculum, we need black faculty, all right? We need black faculty to teach it. Who better to teach black history or black studies than black faculty, okay? And then so came this push to have more black faculty on campus, okay? These pictures here, these are sort of pictures taken, uh, the, the one on the left, taken at, I believe, University of San Francisco, as California and the San Francisco Bay Area has always been a hotbed for political revolution and political a activity, particularly on campuses, all right? The picture to the far right, you can't really see it well, these are students who are walking out of the administration building at Cornell University, all right? These students in, 19, in 1960 took over the administration building with rifles and guns, all right? Held the president hostage, all right? Or fighting for the need to have more black studies and more black faculty and a black student union on campus, okay? This here, I believe, some may argue, I believe that the Cornell situation with the guns, because it was very graphic imagery, all right? But with the guns and the rifles holding the president hostage, this was the turning point, I believe, of the ideological shift in higher education, okay? I believe at that moment, when th once this picture hit the newspapers on Monday morning, I believe that those on the right, Republicans, Republican funders, Republican ide ideologists, made sure to step in and say something has to change because we can't allow this to happen on our campuses, okay? So that picture is pretty iconic. But as you can see, civil rights to black studies, now to black faculty. All right? Then we have affirmative action, okay? Lyndon B. Johnson, 1965, yeah. signing, signing or pushing for affirmative action, all right? Pushing for Civil Rights Act, all right? Effectively in 64 and 65, my belief, 
effectively turning the white vote completely over to the Republican Party. Okay, I believe this is a major shift as he signed for or as he pushed for affirmative action and pushed for the Civil Rights Act. That was the end of the, of the Confederate slave holding South, Southern states ever voting Democrat. Uh, Demo, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Democratic, and it hasn't happened since. It's 2017, right? But this again pushed more of predominantly white colleges in the direction of hiring more black people. Okay. So now, in addition to that, a more modern institution, a more modern term that we have now is what's called a PBI. Okay. PBI stands for predominantly black institution. Okay. We spoke about historically black universities created before 1964. Now you have a few select colleges around the country who that originally started off as predominantly white institutions, but because of demographic changes, gentrification, whatever it may be, they have now turned into predominantly black institutions. Okay? Perfect example, Chicago State University. Chicago State University is not a historically black college. It is a predominantly black college. All right? Anyone that knows the history of Chicago knows that when Chicago State was first created in the 19th century, no black people lived near 95th and King Drive. All right? It wasn't even called King Drive, but you know. Nobody, no black people live in Rosen. All right? Now, you can't find anyone that's not black in Rosen. All right? So it has now become a predominantly black institution. All right? Southeast Arkansas College is another one. What, another PBI that most people don't know is a very large uh, institution, University of Memphis. Okay? University of Memphis is a very large, well-funded institution. It is a predominantly black institution. All right? To be labeled a PBI, a college must confirm that they fit in terms of eligibility set by the U.S. Department of Ed. Okay? Question. Just a quick one. Did Temple University in Philadelphia start as predominantly white and then become predominantly black? Uh, Temple, I'm not sure. My, my, my guess is it started as predominantly white and it still is predominantly white. That's my thought. Uh, but I could be wrong. Sorry. Uh, Sorry. So, just a brief reminder, Questions after the presentation, please. Uh, All right. Um, so these are examples, okay? What makes a PBI? What makes a predominantly black institution? All right? This is, a, as, as I said before, U.S. Department of Education term. The U.S. Department of Education came up with this PBI, predominantly black institution term, okay? In order to be a PBI, a college must have a significant enrollment of needy students, all right? And I'll define what needy means in a minute. Um, average. Expenditure per student must be lower than comparable institutions. So for instance, the average expenditure per student at Chicago State must be lower than a comparable institution such as a governor state, such as a Rock Memorial, such as a Columbia College, okay? Must have an undergrad, undergraduate enrollment of at least 40% black, all right? And it must be accredited or making progress toward accreditation. So what exactly is a needy student, okay? A needy student is a student that receives Pell Grant funds, a student that attended a high school that was eligible for Title I funds, meaning one of the poorer high schools in the country, all right? And the student must be first generation college student and come from a low income family. If a, if a school enrolls a significant portion of needy students and 40% or more black students, it receives funds from the government and is termed a predominantly black institution, okay? So now we have historically black colleges, which are open to black students, and predominantly black institutions, all right? We've come a long way since 1636 when Harvard was created, all right? Now we have an enormous amount of opportunity for black people to attend college, okay? And then we look at the statistics, all right? Right now, blacks comprise roughly 14% of college students in America, all right? Not a bad number, considering that blacks are 12% of the population in the country, okay? So that's pretty good. So one would say, right? A significant increase since the 70s. Pretty good. Caveats with that statement, okay? 14% of college students, that includes historically black colleges, where there is an overabundance of black students, right? That also includes the for-profit sector, all right? Which is predatory when it comes to black students, all right? The largest demographic of University of Phoenix students are black, okay? It's not a, it's not a wonderful university, very low standards, but very high debt. Okay, this whole uh, uh, corporatization of higher education that brings on this profit, these for-profit institutions, these online institutions, they seek out working class black adults, all right? 
along with others as well. Also comprise 5% of college faculty. All right, 5% of college faculty around the country are African American. Again, that includes HBCUs where there is an overabundance. But not a great number, but much better than what it's been. That's just the truth, all right? 5%, much better than what it's been. So I put the statement down there, not great, but not bad, right? Not great, but not bad. Seems like we're moving in the right direction. So typically when I have this presentation, I bring up this link, and it's a link that you can click that goes to the SAE fraternity in Oklahoma, at Oklahoma University, all right? I'm sorry, University of Oklahoma, um, where it was two years ago, three years ago, uh, this all-white fraternity, they had a nice chant, a nice saying, right, that they would do whatever they had to do to not allow a black person to be in the fraternity, okay? Uh, you know, of course, you know, the N-word was abundant. That's just what yeah. it was, right? Um, but graphic images in the song about hanging black, black men from trees, all right? Anyone that tries to join the organization or the fraternity, they will hang them from a tree. This is 2014, okay? Not 1914, 2014. But I usually have the link, and the link will go to their video. We don't have internet access, so that's fine. Um, so then I go to these images here, all right, which pretty much tell the story without even saying a word. Okay, the first image up on the right, University of Michigan, orientation, all right, orientation. Their name tags on the table in orientation. The names that are typically black, someone has taken the liberty of writing the word nigger under the names, all right? You see Trayvon, you see Tyrese, there's the word nigger, okay, University of Michigan. That was Monday. That was this past Monday, okay, September 2017, all right? University of North Dakota, Black Lives Matter with the blackface pictures, okay? That was 2016, all right, 2016. At American University, you can see here, this is a picture of the Confederate flag. On that Confederate flag, there are attached actual pieces of cotton, okay? Pieces of cotton attached to the Confederate flag. That was Tuesday. That was Tuesday, September 2017, okay? And then Auburn University, which, is, I mean, you can't get any more explicit than to have a KKK sheet and a Confederate flag in the background. I mean, the message that you're sending is clear, okay? The, time of the, uh, the timing of this is stunning, again, because 2017, 2017, 2016, this was a little, uh, a little later. But also, to look at the regions, okay? University of Michigan, all right? That's not University of Mississippi. That's Michigan. That's the University of Michigan, okay? University of North Dakota, all right? Racism is not accepted anywhere, but the University of North Dakota, truth of the matter, there's not a lot of us up there, okay? There's just not a lot of black people in North Dakota. No. So I, you can somewhat sometimes expect some sort of warped views about uh, black people and racism. American University, that's in D.C. That's in D.C. If I'm not mistaken, you all can tell me. I think we just had a black man in, in public housing in D.C. for the past eight, eight years. Um, like uh, Barry, good Barry Hussein, right? Um, but this is what this is what we have, okay? So these are just pictures that I have just to sort of drive home the point of what's going on in these campuses, all right? Again, this is a link that I have. UCLA students in uh, 2014, black male students, they got together, they, they made this video to explain all the things that they're going through. Uh, it was very informational and they sort of transformed it into a poem. We don't have any that access so we can't really watch it, but I usually have it here for people to see. Um, so now when we shift, again, it's a very broad topic, African Americans in higher education. You can go so many ways. Now I'm sort of getting into the crux of my research, okay? And my research is about black men who become presidents of predominantly white colleges, okay? So now as we look at the stats for black males, for black men who are in college, okay? Black males comprise 4% of all students enrolled in college. 4%. That's including historically black colleges. Again, all right, where you can find a, 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 a large amount of black males. 4%, all right. And the power of five sports conferences. I don't know how many sports fans we have in here, how many college sports fans we have. But when we talk Big Ten, Big East, ACC, SEC, and Big 12, all right, the power of five conferences, black males make up 2% of the students. 2% of the students, but at these same colleges, they are 56% of the football team, Yeah. right? And they are 60% of the men's basketball team, okay? Something is lopsided here. Something is lopsided here. 2% of the student body 
60% of the men's basketball team. So what did that bring about, all right? 2017, you have these really nice buzzwords now, right? One of them is microaggression. Microaggression, meaning racial slights that are directed toward people of color that are seen or that are deemed offensive, okay? A racial slight, if a black male is in one of these colleges at the Power Five conferences, all right, and he's walking across campus, and a white student sees him on campus and walk by and say, good game yesterday, all right? But the black guy's not on the team, okay? He's just a student, right? Or, hey, big wing yesterday, wonderful job. Hey, I'm a chemistry major. Yeah, I don't know anything about the wings, right? <laughs> this is what tends to happen. This is how black men experience college, okay? Or it's the reverse, right? I'm only here because I can play sports. If I couldn't play sports, I wouldn't be here for anything else, right? Whether, whether the student body perceives it about me or whether I perceive it about myself, okay? Lowest completion rate of all race, all races and all genders, black men, all right? 67% of the black men who start college will not graduate. 67%. That means you have three black men in the room, two of them will not graduate college. Plain and simple. The lowest completion rate of all races and genders, all right? That's where we are. So common, common resolutions, or I should say uh, reasons or resolutions, typically. As a black man who's been through college, has graduated three times, I've heard all of these inside and out, okay? What's wrong with the black men? Why can't they finish college? Black boys, what's the problem? Why do they go to jail? Why do they drop out of high school? Why can't they get through college? It must be the parenting, all right? The parenting values are bad in the black community. It must be terrible, all right? We need better parents. Parents need to be better. The parents are getting younger, they're dumber, right? Improve K-12 schooling and instruction, all right? That's the real problem, right, correct? By the time a black guy gets to college, he is underprepared. Why is he underprepared? Because his K-12 school didn't do a good job. It was underfunded. It was poor teaching, whatever, whatever excuses you may have. Financial help. A lot of smart black guys in college, they can't afford college, all right? They can't afford college. They need financial help. These are, these are not my recommendations. These are the popular recommendations I'm giving out that we hear all the time, all right? More high school to college transition programs. A lot of black guys want to go to college. They don't know how to get there. Okay? Or once they find a good college, getting acclimated to the campus is difficult, right? Campuses of belonging and engagement. Okay? I'm on a campus. I'm at the University of Chicago. Or I'm at Loyola. I'm at DePaul. I'm at the University of Illinois. I don't feel welcome here. No one looks like me. No one talks like me. No one thinks like me. And there's nothing here that represents me at all on this campus. All right? And increased black male faculty. Right? That's always thrown out as sort of an answer. Increased black male faculty. And it has proven to work through research. The issue is, if you can't get me to go here and finish, how can I ever become a professor? Okay? So these are some of the more common resolutions that are given. All right? So my research in particular takes a different look. All right? I'm sorry, you can't see that. I'll explain it to you. It's the, the coloring sort of mixed up. So one solution that's often neglected, right, although there are not many black males on these campuses, those that are there, that our students, that our faculty, they need to be encouraged to be administrators, okay? If you are in administration, you make policy. You make policy-related decisions. You create the rules. Faculty don't create the rules. They have a lot of power, right? But they don't create the rules. Administrators create the rules. So you can have, you can recruit more black students. You can, you can recruit more black faculty, all right? But if you don't have diverse administration, the people who make the policies and who make the programming don't understand how to connect with black students, okay? Um, this here is a pie chart where I explain or try to show the numbers of black male administrators in higher education, all right? Administrators, black males make up 3% of college administrators in higher education, 3%. That is including historically black colleges where they are overrepresented, overrepresented, okay? Historically black colleges, there are 105 of them. 70 percent of those colleges are ran by black men. <coughs> All right, so they have a large amount of black men who run those colleges. But even with those, those numbers, we're still three percent. Three percent. All right. This is an area that is not discussed and not targeted, but it should be. Okay. Focusing on black male and faculty recruitment 
to enhance diversity while ignoring presence in the administration is a paradox. A paradox. All right. Colleges will break their necks to give out to give scholarships to black people. Right. They'll, they'll break their necks to recruit black faculty. Let's not even mention Rick Pitino, University of Louisville. Let's not even mention the lengths they will go to to recruit black athletes. They'll put their jobs on the line. They'll accept money that they shouldn't accept. Right? I don't know if any, like I said, I don't know how many uh, uh, sports fans are in attendance, right? University of Louisville, Rick Pitino, he got fired on Wednesday. Fired on Wednesday. Recruited prostitutes. Prostitutes to entertain black recruits when they came on campus, right? That's, I mean, as it, it, ridiculous and as immoral as that is, that took a lot of work for him to do, right? That took a lot of work for him to do. Money that he took from Adidas. He took over $100,000 from Adidas to funnel two high school kids with the promise that if you come here, you'll get more of this, right? The ingenuity in his, his recruiting practices is just unbelievable. Imagine if the colleges will put that into black male students, faculty, and administration, right? The message that is sent to black boys, black men, you can run for us, you can play for us, you can perform for us, but you cannot think with us, and you cannot learn with us, okay? Students perform better, research has proven, students perform better at schools where the demographic is represented in leadership, all right? We just said 67% of black males do not graduate, all right? If this statement is true, Having more black male administrators will increase the performance of black male students. All right. So I had a few research questions um, that were tied to my research, to my dissertation, and the work that I did. I wanted to interview black men who are presidents of predominantly white colleges. Okay. So that was my dissertation. I interviewed black men who are presidents of predominantly white colleges. At the time of my dissertation, there were 30 black men who were presidents of predominantly white colleges, all right? I interviewed 16 of them, all right? 16 of them. What I wanted to know is, one, how, let me make sure I read this, um, how or what sort of adversity did they face on their path to being a president, all right? Um, how do they believe race affected their path to presidency and um, how their career experiences affected the way that they lead their institutions, okay? So just to give a little background about the, the, the participants, as I said, I interviewed black men who are presidents of predominantly white institutions. There were 30 of them at the time, 30 of them. Right now in America, there are 2,241 predominantly white institutions. Black men led 30 of them, okay, 30 of them. 78% of the institutions in this country are predominantly white institutions. Black men leading 30, that was 1%, all right, 1% of these universities have black men who are presidents, okay? So what exactly is a PWI? What is a predominantly white institution? It's a four-year co-ed institution that has at least 50% white enrollment, all right? 78% 70, of our colleges, 2,241 in this country, are predominantly white institutions, okay? Um, that just pretty much just said what I just said just now, all right? Analysis, okay? Analysis, um, there's no, there is no monolithic prototype of black male president, okay? Out of the 16 men that I interviewed, all of their experiences were different, all right? They had 16 different experiences. Um, many of them held, uh, 13 of them held PhDs, uh, two of them had either JD or MD, all right? And one only had a master's. Uh, some of them hold MBAs. Seven men were born in the former Confederate states of the American South. Uh, and eight men came from the academic ranks. Uh, I really hate I can't read that top one. But six of these men attended or graduate, graduated from historically black colleges. Uh, Twelve men identified as Christians. Seven were participating in these leadership development programs. All right, so here I have set here a general profile of black men who are presidents of predominantly white institutions. Most of them graduated from white institutions. Okay, most of them graduated from white institutions. The idea that white institutions recruit their own. Okay, most of them are former tenured professors. They have a doctorate in higher ed administration. They're Christian, all right? A very important fact. They're Christian. Most of them are Christian. All of them were married. All of them were married, all right? And it goes into this notion that uh, uh, a college president must fit a certain profile. 
in particular, a college president at a large white university, and if you're a black man that wants to leave these universities, you must fit a certain profile. Single men, right, or men with children out of wedlock, they're not really taken into account in these situations, right, and whether that's explicitly explained or not. Um, many of them had administrative mentors, professional leadership development programs, and they worked at multiple institutions, okay? Uh, when it came to overcoming adversity, they leaned on their spirituality, all right? They leaned on their mentors, their insight from leadership training, uh, including the entire campus in the de de decision-making process, and many of them had an upbringing doing segregation, so they had a deep understanding and appreciation for education, all right? Eight, eight of the men said racism was a significant part of their day-to-day -day lives, all right? Many of them spoke of being mistaken for their assistant. Okay? Setting up meetings with people, and people come in and say, hey, I'm here to see the president, can you go get him? <laughs> and the president says, I am the man you're looking for, all right? Personal threats of police protection, all right? One president in the great state of Michigan, I won't say what college, all right, had the word nigger spray painted on his car, oh, come on. all right? And had to be walked out through uh, police escort to his car. We're talking 2009 when this happened. All right? He didn't make a big deal out of it. He said he expected it once he got the job, but it didn't stop him from doing what he had to do. Um, four men said that racism was not prevalent at all with their jobs, and the other four said that it was prevalent, but it was not a big deal, and that they didn't have a problem. Um, so how were these men able to become president? How were they able to, if we got all these, these gloomy statistics about black men in college, how were they able to get there, okay? Uh, most of them say they were able to withstand these racist climates on, on campus longer than other black men. Essentially, they held out longer, all right? Whatever it is, through it was spirituality, through it was, a, it was a, a sort of toughness, whatever it may be, they stuck around longer, all right? They adapted and they assimilated to the white campus, all right? Um, they felt that they were no smarter than other men in similar situations they didn't make it, all right? There's always that idea of, with black guys that do make it. I'm no smarter than the guy that didn't make it. I'm no smarter than the guy that was on the corner. We just had different opportunities. We had different advantages, mm -hmm. all right? Chameleons, all right, but not sellouts, right? The black community has this thing about being a sellout if you are in certain certain settings, in certain professions, speak a certain way, just a certain way that you're some sort of sellout. They argued against the idea of sellout and instead reframed it as chameleon. I'm fitting in, I'm sort of blending in to what I need to do. Uh, the only difference between these men and non-black presidents are the encounters of racism. Everything else that they experience on a day-to-day -day basis were pretty much the same. All right. So, and these are my last two slides here. Um, implications for administrators, and what I mean by that is, for black men who want to become presidents, my research has shown first and foremost that you must first focus on your current job, whatever the job may be. Okay, you may be a vice president, you may be uh, an admissions counselor. Do the best you can at your current job. All right. Second of all, get a faculty position. Most black men who want to be presidents, you have to teach. Okay, you have to be in the classroom. Be prepared, have the proper motivation. You should have your job if you work on the college campus. You should be there for the students, not for yourself. That's not always the case, all right? Most people, oh, I'm sorry, not most. Some people on college campuses, they're working for themselves. They're working for their paycheck, they're working for the prestige. They're not working for students. Um, avoid being pigeonholed. What do I mean by avoid being pigeonholed? What I mean is typically when there is a black man that makes it through, undergrad, he makes it through graduate school, he does get hired, he does get on campus, they make him the director of what's our cultural student affairs. Or they make him the director of the Black Male Center. Or they make him the diversity officer, right? All of those are wonderful jobs. I'm not taking anything away from those jobs. But those sort of jobs, if you are the black man in that job, typically you stay there for the rest of your career. Because you get seen as a person, that's the black guy, he knows diversity. That's the black guy, he knows black students. Well, we need a president that knows all students, so we'll keep Malik will keep Tariq in that job, okay? Uh, find mentors and expand your professional networks. Your professional network, if you're a black man and want to be a president, it has to be, your network has to be larger than black people. You must get to know white people, Hispanic people, Asian people, Native American people, mixed people, whomever it may be, all right? As for the institutions, okay? Attend to administrative diversity with the same intent and resources as student and faculty diversity and your athletic teams. As I said, White universities will break their necks to recruit black athletes. Fly across the country, come to your living room, all right, give you money they, sh they shouldn't give you, give you things they shouldn't give you, to get you on the field. Use some of that same energy to get you in the classroom, all right? 
encourage the black male grad students and faculty to <coughs> administrative careers and recruit HBCU administrators. Many large white universities don't want to recruit administrators from historically black colleges. And so the black colleges typically are not respected to the level of predominantly white colleges. All right, you have maybe a handful of historically black colleges that sort of hold their own in the public view. Howard University, Hampton University, all right, Spelman, Morehouse, and maybe Florida A&M or Fisk. After that, it's pretty much up for grabs. There are 105 historically black colleges. Not five, 105, okay? So my last slide, conclusion. Um, these are the men who are absent from the scholarly discussion, all right, the ones that make it through. We are in love with the deficit, the deficit perspective or the popular narrative. One in three black men go to jail, all right? One in two black men have children out of wedlock. Those sort of statistics, right? The idea is if one in three black men go to jail, I think we should spend more time talking to the two men that didn't, okay? In order to get a different perspective. Um, asking successful black men how they achieve is the most effective way. Um, in 2016, representation is still too low, but with this study, Hopefully, it sort of gives an idea of what can happen if we expand black male presence in higher education. All right? And that is my presentation. Wow. Oh, okay, you're ready to take questions now? Yes. Yeah, this will be questions now, but I'm, I'm going to take five minutes to finish eating my here. Just call on people, you know, okay. when they... The you know, um, okay. that, that's okay. Just, just keep it up there because we'll be loud enough. Okay. Um, you know what you're saying about success with the black man could generally be surmised as success with any immigrant group or even myself. You know, you work hard, you get to know people, you do a best at your job. How is it different with the black man versus the same people? who may be white or Hispanic or, or something along those lines, because ideally what you're describing with those black presidents is almost the same process that a white person has to go through, or a Hispanic, or somebody else. And it just, it seems to me like the only reason you're not successful or see more in the profession is you haven't had the amount of time involved with it since the civil rights movement started. And, and that's, a, that's a good question. Um, People often ask, why is the black community so far behind, right? There are other communities that have come here, that have come here poor, that have come here, they've been uh, discriminated against, they, they have faced racism themselves, um, but they've gotten ahead, they've gotten further than the black community. Uh, what is taking black people so long, right? And then that sort of leads to a question of it must be something that's going on internally, right? So internal problems are real. You never, never want to romanticize the situation. Internal problems are real, right? Typically when it comes to the black community, um, one view, one view that, that, that is typically held is out of all of the groups of people that have come here onto this country, we were the only ones that were forced, right? We were the only ones that came in the bottom of a ship, okay? So to that extent, right, we were the only ones where it was illegal to read, right? It was illegal to be taught to read. Then once we were free, we were free with nothing, right? And then once we became free, we had Jim Crow laws that sort of set us behind, right? And we were the last ones to vote, all right? So it, this, this, this understanding that there are a lot of different groups of people that have faced discrimination, right? Somehow or another, we always get around to being last to receiving the rights that we're supposed to have. As a follow-up real quick, I remember a certain class when I was in college, and there was a discussion about racism. I found that some of the black sorority sisters, when they were describing the color range, the amount of sellouts, I found them to probably be the most judgmental, most arrogant people I ever saw in this particular class. I certainly was not racist, but they did not give me the best impression. I said, no wonder they're having so much trouble. You judge people like this, can you please comment? Yes, uh, and that's actually a very real accurate statement, right? So uh, the fraternities and, and the sororities, sororities in particular, the, the notion of colorism, all right, colorism has always been a very significant thing in a black community, right? Light preferred to dark, all right? The lighter you are, the better you are. The darker you are, the worse you are. The dumber you are, the less desirable you are, right? As we all know, that is internalized self-hate, okay? Internalized self-hate. That comes from the idea of the lighter the better because lighter is closer to whiter, right? So that is, that, that is whiter, not only in skin tone, right, but also we have this thing in the community with, with the hair, okay? The straighter the hair, the smoother the hair, the better, 
All right. But naturally, black hair is kinky, it's nappy, and it's supposed to be like that. It's beautiful like that. Um, so the, 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 the judgment within the community is absolutely real. Has been since 1619 when we got here, and it's still prevalent in 2017, right, today. It's very, very judgmental. But that, in my opinion, is internalized self-hate, disliking who you are, all right, simply because that's what you, society has disliked you since day one, so you, in turn, take that inside. Is that right. called stereotype? All right, next question, please. Right, no problem. Uh, well, well, I was around in the 1960s, and uh, I heard Malcolm X. I, I watched this man come up. He scared the hell out of me. <laughs> Th this guy was the most racist person, and later on he supposedly changed. I, I don't believe that. That's just an economic thing. He was uh, a dope pusher. He was a burglar. He was a criminal and a racist. And Chicago named a college after him. How could that be? I don't know any other state had a college after him. So, uh, to, to this point, uh, Malcolm, Malcolm Little. Malcolm Little was a dope pusher. Malcolm Little was a pimp. Malcolm, Malcolm Little was a drug addict. Malcolm Little was a burglar. Right? Malcolm X was someone different. Right? Malcolm X was a Muslim. Right? Malcolm X was a speaker. Right? Malcolm X was an extremely intelligent man. Did he hold racist views? Did Malcolm X, not little, but like Malcolm X after the transition. Ma Malcolm X, did he hold racist views? Some of his early views could be viewed as racist. Absolutely, right? The change, you mentioned it briefly. He did make a change when he broke away from the Nation of Islam. Right? He threw him out, didn't he? No, he left. Okay. He left. <coughs> they killed him. They did, yeah, absolutely. He broke, when he broke away from the Nation of Islam, he realized that the Islam that was taught to him by Elijah Muhammad was a lie. All right? Elijah Muhammad teaches Islam as black supremacy. Right? Yeah. Malcolm X took his highs to Mecca, right? And saw Orthodox Islam with his own eyes and realized what I learned in Chicago, what I learned in Harlem, what I learned in America was a lie. Islam is not a religion based on race. Islam is based on brotherhood. When he got there, he realized, and he said in his own words, I have shared beds, I have drunk, food, drunk water, I share food with brothers whose skin is the whitest of white, eyes are the bluest of blue, right here, the blindest of blind. These are my brothers. These white people are my brothers. These brown people are my brothers. He had a far more inclusive ideology for the last year and a half of his life. To your point, he was killed by the Nation of Islam, right? He was killed. He became an enemy of the Nation of Islam and they killed him. Largely because he began to speak the truth about Elijah Muhammad's lies and Nation of Islam didn't like that. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, thank you so much. And I, I have done medicine in the Chicago public schools, and I've had biracial kids in my family, so I appreciate what you're saying. In Ireland, the term we use for Sinn Féin is ourselves alone, that idea we're by ourselves. What are your thoughts, though? Currently, right now, the highest percentage of medical providers of African descent are Nigerian. Thank the highest IQ of medical providers. Mm -hmm. Let's look at the reality. So if you look at the genetic data, it's very mixed. Why is it that Europeans can get along with white Americans like Irish? We have a foundation to help Irish Americans. Where is the problem with dialogue where we could use African strength, particularly upper class African strength, to help African Americans? I'm really saddened by the tragedy here. Mm -hmm. Because the problem is, if we continue to stay mediocre, I worry. Mm -hmm. I know we can use African to African American strength, but I don't know why the cultural detractions get away from that. So my question to you, or we now have Africans that are part Japanese, their strength. Mm -hmm. You see it. It's not genetic. It is cultural. Mm -hmm. And what are what are your thoughts on that, and how we could how we could work together? That's a, a really good question. When it comes to the lack of African American and African unity, yes. that, that's real. It's it, very real. Yes, it, it, that's not that's not for make believe. Um, a, a large part of that is because African Americans have no conceptual understanding of their African history. So, for instance, when you can come across uh, the average white person walking down the street, right? If they're Irish. They'll tell you I'm Irish American, I'm Polish American, I'm Greek American, I am Italian American. You ask a black person, he says I'm African American. Africa is a continent, right? Black people, myself included, when you ask a, a black born American, a, a black person that was born in America, they don't say I'm Nigerian American, I'm South African, or I'm, I'm Kenyan American, I'm Libyan American, I'm, I'm uh, 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 Congolese. We have no conception to our African past, right? I, for instance, I have no idea what country I come from. No idea, right? I, I don't know if I'm Nigerian, I don't know if I'm West African, I don't know what it may be. No clue, 
right? The large majority of black people walking the street don't know where we come from. So with that, there's a cultural divide between us and our brothers on the African continent, right? right? right, right. And because there's that cultural divide, oftentimes we see each other as enemies, right? Really? Yeah, we don't see each other as brothers. We don't see each other as let's unite. They see us as lazy, yeah. right? They see us as hip hop infested, right? They see us as <laughs> as uh, on our way to the jail, to, to the penitentiary, right? And we don't see them as our brothers. So that divide sort of prevents those on the continent from coming and giving us some help, or us here in America sort of uh, uh, sort of linking up with them to get some sort of help for, for whatever reason. Yeah. Um, but a lot of it is because with the slavery came the loss of history, right? Yeah. I don't. As again, I don't know where I come from, right? I don't know what what country I come from. Therefore, I don't know what my original religion is, right? I don't know what my original name is, right? I we take on the names of the, our slave master. I still have the name. My my, my name is Dewitt Scott, right? That's not an African name, right? right? And I come from a long line of the West Scots. Right? So when you don't have that sort of cultural background and understanding, then you don't understand that those on the, on the continent can be your helper and your connection. As a matter of fact, you start to see them as an enemy as you were taught. Right? We, we are taught Africa is grassland, right? it's animals. Right? And then you see Nairobi and it looks like Chicago. Right? And then, that, I mean, that's a, a new understanding for black people, let alone anyone else. So without that sort of cultural connection and understanding of our personal history, then we don't understand that we need to get together and sort of help uh, with the medical profession, any other profession. Yeah, thank you. So I hear that currently uh, Chicago State's under more pressure, funding, et cetera. Uh, yeah, so Chicago State has had its funding issues, yes. Um, a lot of that is, is due to the budget. A lot of it is due to past leaders, right? It's not all Springfield. Some past leaders have mismanaged money, right? A lot of that is due to the past president, right? I, Wayne Watson, I was not a fan. I did not like him. Okay, I just didn't. Uh, I think now with the new president, new administration, things are going to turn around. Um, but it was, it was for a lot of factors, right? But I think at the same time, it's, it's not going to close. It won't close. I don't no, see that it won't close. Yeah, I, absolutely I not. I don't see that happening at all. Yeah. Did you ever interview any female African American uh, presidents? I didn't, um, which would have been great, but but the scope of my, that would have made the scope of my dissertation entirely too large. I still be in school now. Um, yeah. If that was the case, but I would like to, at some point, expand on the research and speak to African African American female uh, presidents, because my understanding is they're even less African American female presidents of white universities than they are males. Oh, really? Yeah. Really? Yes, Shirley Ann Jackson is there. Shirley Ann Jackson. Yes, absolutely. Yes. If, if I may, my uh, one of my friends of mine was, was a large recruiter for a company for a while. He had a department of about 30 people. He had about 20 black women administrators who worked under him, and he had 10 of, the, of uh, other ethnic groups. He said, I never met a more discriminatory batch of people, and I understand it's not the entire thing, but can you explain why it is that some people who continually play the race card get ahead in, in, in some of corporate America. So by, you say play the race card to get ahead, you mean as far as? They're claiming discrimination all the time when there really is none. Or they're using the race card as a political advantage against somebody else. Oh, okay, I see what you're saying. Um, so they, I, I think that there may be instances where black people uh, tend to use the race card for their advantage, right? Mm -hmm. My firm belief is the large majority of black people who quote unquote use the race card are speaking truth. Um, they really feel they're being discriminated against. Right. Um, they really feel that there is some injustice at play, uh, and they're not doing it. Because one thing about it, um, <coughs> sort of coming forward and explaining racism or, or pointing out discrimination is extremely painful. Mm -hmm. It's an extremely difficult thing to do. So that's something that most black people wouldn't do for fun, right? Because it's, it, it's almost, um, for lack of a better uh, comparison, when you have rape cases, right? Women who come forward to, to talk, say they've been sexually assaulted, the large majority of them have been sexually assaulted. Like, it, it's such a painful process to prove and to go through that you wouldn't play around with that. Right? So pointing out discrimination, racism, injustice, uh, systemic injustice or whatever, a lot of black people actually believe that they are being discriminated against. Mm -hmm. right? um, those that use it to get ahead, I'm not 100% I'm not, I'm not sure about those. I, I want to get this, but you've been waiting for some time. But thank you. We talked about this before, but I wanted to ask you what, what's the uh, 
<coughs> experience of black students in mostly white colleges? How do they deal with all the discrimination and prejudice that they encounter? Well, so, and that's a good question. And, and I talked about historically black colleges up here, I talked about white colleges, and I talked about PBIs. I attended all three. I attended a historically black college, I attended a, predomin I attended a predominantly white college, and I attended a predominantly black college, all right? Usually, when coming across racist incidents, as I did in my white college when I was in undergrad, right, and when I got my master's, usually when black students come across those experiences, they band together, all right? There's such small numbers on campus that typically when the black students find each other, they're so happy to see each other, right? You get the orientation sometimes, and you see that one black person all the way on the other side, you go and find them and you hug them, right? And once you hug them, you all become friends instantly, right? And you stick together, and you recruit others, and you, and you sort of lean on each other for sort of emotional and social support and help. So they sort of come together, and they stick together on the campus, and they feed off each other, and they take care of one another, emotionally, physically, whatever it may be. Um, but, but in response to, the, to, to that, unity on campus typically is a response. Well, di didn't the Supreme Court rule uh, affirmative action unconstitutional? Uh, to my understanding, uh, they did it. I know they just had the Abigail Fisher situation down at the University of Texas. Uh, but they actually, they, um, well, Abigail Fisher was pushing for colleges to stop considering race when letting students in, and she lost. To my understanding, she lost. So as of right now, colleges are still allowed to push affirmative action and to consider race when bringing students into college. Yeah. Question. Yeah. Hi. Um, I guess the, I guess I'm, I would like your comment on this, um, and I'll expand on it in the thing. But I think it's interesting what you just said about systemic injustice, and um, I, I also had that experience of that I think, you know, it's difficult to talk about, but um, I had, my stepfather was kind of behind this Charles Murray um, research that the white establishment's pushing. Um, it's kind of the white, really racist uh, group, right? And, um, and so, you know, once he kind of, he's gone now, and I'm I now lining up with the African-American uh, movement, the civil rights movement, and because it does help me get courage, you know, to speak up about injustice, right? I mean, used to be I didn't even understand what it was, you know, but um, the more I study and I'm involved with the National Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression, and it, you know, the, it's just really interesting. You understand so much by, by um, lining up with the African American Civil Rights Movement and go back and learn. Um, another, just okay. something I want to mention was uh, I went back and I also I had taught okay. in a half black It is, it is reminded daughter. that this I is know. a question she, 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 period she and uh, All right, I'll questions, bring it up please. Later. Okay. That's Thanks. good. I'll cut it off there. Thank All you. right, what time is it, by the way, Andy? Uh, it's, it's about 22. Okay. I, I watch your wedding video. What's that? Your wedding, your wedding video. Video. You, you say you're waiting for me? Yeah, your 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 video, your wedding. Your wedding uh -huh. I watch. I watch that. Okay. And uh, I watch three times. Okay. And I was looking for a white people there. Where where was this? Video on a on a Google. Your Google? video link. You oh. saw your video link. Marriage video. <laughs> marriage video. Marriage. You got married, right? Yeah. 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 In your video posted uh, on internet. Oh, okay, okay, all right, all right. Took me a minute. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. So, so, so I, I watched the first, first time I watched, mm -hmm. and I didn't see any white people. <laughs> Second time I watched, <laughs> you know, yeah. I saw, I saw one guy, one guy little, but I wasn't sure. Okay. So I went third time, and and you know, I said, well, you know. I got to ask this guy a question. He's like, this guy don't like white people. <laughs> I, I, my, my question is this, is that, what do, I mean, what do you think about white people? <laughs> can, can, can you elaborate that? I mean, I know you're talking about, you know, you know okay. you're talking about black people. What do you think about white? All right, okay. That's, that's the first time I got that question, right? Uh, <laughs> what do I think about white people? Uh, I think white people like all people. I think that, the majority of people on this earth have good in them. 
and the majority, the majority, the large majority, excuse me, the large majority of people, large majority of white people want to do good. They want good for everybody. All right. There's a small minority that is racist. There's a small minority that is discriminatory. There's a small minority that is evil. All right. But I think the majority of white people are honest people, hardworking people, people who believe in others, and people who want the best for everyone. As I do about black people, brown people, uh, and whomever else. But that's my thought. Are you, are, you trying, are you trying to put a button on that? Question. I, I, think, I think he had a question. Now come in. Go ahead, Gene. You mentioned there were 105, roughly 105 predominantly black universities. Uh, I know it's not the subject of your research, but what of the presidents of those 105, do you have any idea how many are headed by a white male and how many are headed by a white female and uh, black uh, or you know race, uh, race and gender? Yeah, no, I, I do know. Of the 105 historically black colleges in America, none are ran by white people. None. You have one white president of 105 historically black colleges. All right. Seventy percent of historically black colleges are ran by black men. The other 30 percent by black women. But there, uh, there's no other uh, race or ethnicity that leads historically black colleges but black people. Thank you. No problem. No problem. Yeah. Well, well, I find blacks are very verbal and expressive and speak well, good speakers. But when they crack the books in college, their own people say you're acting white. Mm -hmm. Is that right? <laughs> no, no. And what he's saying is something that is prevalent in parts of the community. Right? This idea of acting white. That if you're good at academics, you're acting white, right? Uh, Claude Steele and all these other researchers that come up with, that, with, with this idea. That exists, again, in a small part of the black community, right? The larger black community, I know as a bookworm myself, the larger black community, academics are celebrated, right? So you have those who are, we'll just say thugs, they're street thugs, they're, 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 they're street gangsters, whatever it may be. In the black community, the large majority of them protect the ones who are actually crack open the books, do their work, do their homework, as if to say, I'm in this life, I would like to not be in this life, I wish I was you, so I'll do what I can to make sure you don't end up here. All right. So black academic excellence is celebrated in the black community. There's a small portion that do believe that uh, if you're smart, you act white. Over here. Right here. Uh, given the kind of times we're in, Given any thought to the financial viability of either the historically black colleges or the others that have been yeah. like, I mean, it's Chicago State's a perfect example. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, what's the future for these schools, you know, given the conservative? That, that's a really good question. He asked about the financial viability of uh, historically black colleges. Historically black colleges, for almost as long as they've been open, have been in trouble financially, underwater financially. A number of them have closed. That's just the truth. My firm belief, they're 105 now. Uh, my firm belief is that 20 years from now, there won't be 105. <laughs> Some are going to close. Um, public colleges overall are struggling, and black colleges are the poorest of the poor. Um, so it, I don't even blame it on necessarily conservative movement against public education. Whether it was a conservative or, or a liberal, they would still be in trouble. Uh, but without, <laughs> without adequate funding and without alumni giving back, Many of these colleges won't make it, and I don't believe in 20 years. I believe in 20 years, at least one or maybe more will close. That's a good question. Go ahead. Uh, are there any study abroad or um, exchange programs um, with countries in Africa? Or uh, on, on black colleges or just country or just with any college period? I guess with any college in the United States? Uh, yes, there, there are a number of study abroad opportunities in, uh, in Africa um, for students that want to do sort of work over there. Chicago State University has relationships with Kenya, with Nigeria, with Ghana, and with um, South Africa. And so we've had students go do study abroad to the African continent. So it does exist. Thank yeah. you. Is there a greater cultural continuity feature for kids that go to the back colleges because they come Christians? organization or because they come from like say a more poly poly uh, city like New York Los Angeles do you guys know anything about that what's a greater predictor that they're from like a private Christian group or they come from a city that maybe celebrates them any ideas uh, a greater prediction a, a greater predictor for I'm attending historically black colleges. 
Oh, uh, to my understanding, there's no sort of uh, stereotypical or uh, prototypical background knowledge of who is more likely to attend a, a, a black college. I think the closest we have is the, the, the family culture in the home. Uh, typically, uh, families that promote black culture among their children when they're small, those children, or families whose parents went to historically black colleges, yeah. those students tend to go on to black colleges. Like Spelman, um, yeah. Spelman. Absolutely, right? And a lot of it too is black colleges are cheaper, right? Black colleges have, the truth of the matter, more open admission standards. So you have some students who may not be able to afford a Loyola, but can afford a Wilberforce. Yeah. You know, so a lot of it sometimes are financial factors and, and, and academics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know if this is new earlier, but all the complaints filed against employers to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, and this has been going on for years, there's been only 1% or less, is there a finding of discrimination? Mm -hmm. Do you have any explanation of why that is? Uh, right, it's not your area, so I don't... It's not my research area, but, but to the 1% of the findings of the discrimination, I would say, um, how many police officers have been guilty for killing an armed men? Zero percent. You don't answer question or the question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're right. You're right. So I, I'll, I'll answer yeah, my own question. questions in this class. Then you are. You are. Yeah, I'm so, a student. So I'll, I'll pose the question, right? How many cops are found guilty for killing blood on our black men? I'll answer the question. Zero. <laughs> yeah. So if you add someone who has been accosted by police or who sees Walter Scott on camera running away, from the officer and get shot in the back, and you come to him and say, "Hey, nobody's been arrested. I mean, nobody has been charged with this or, or convicted of this crime." Then, when you come with that same question to say only one percent of there's only been one percent of findings of discrimination in employment, then you tend to say, All "Right, that may not be that, that number may not actually indicate the truth." No, not. Uh, do you have a clear uh, understand how, how many white students go to black colleges? Is there any uh, numbers on that? Uh, I don't know. It's a very small percentage. And I said I went to a black college. I went to the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. There were white students, right? Um, a very small amount. So there's also this myth that black colleges exclude non-black people, and that's not the truth. Black colleges are open to all students. Any white student can attend a black college anytime. That's mm -hmm. so the one thing I want to say. You know, one thing with, with the black people. I look at more like an ethnic group now rather than a race. They, they, they don't seem to, uh, like other ethnic groups will open up small businesses in our communities. Black people don't do that. They don't, they don't, they don't uh, open up their own little small shops and businesses. They, they, everybody else comes in and does business in our, in our community. Yeah, absolutely. That's we, a big drawback to your community. It's, 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 to a large degree, we don't open up our own business, right? A, a lot of it is the financial capital that we don't have, right? A lot of that is the, um, the lack of income that we, we just don't have, right? We're the least employed, right? We're the least educated. So in, in turn, that we come with the least amount of wealth, right? Personal wealth. So without the personal wealth, then you don't have the mindset or you don't even have the means or resources to do the commercial businesses in your community. Um, so I mean, it, it, it's a lot that's behind that, right? But overall, no, we don't. Other communities come into our community and, and you know, and pilfer from us day and night. Um, but it, there's a lot of reasons, factors, starting with lack of wealth in black community. We're going to go to rebuttals in a minute. Okay. Uh, finish up the questions now. We'll start to rebuttals in a minute. Uh, one last one here. One last question. Um, even though there are an exceedingly low number of uh, black college presidents, I'm willing to bet there are a larger percentage of CEOs in business because boards and the organizations that hold them to honesty uh, are watching more closely about racial mix, where private colleges, especially Christian white colleges, tend to make their own rules. And there's a history there and how we've always been and how we've looked and how we want to look that I think there's more progress made in the private sector industry with black leadership today. I'm at a loss to think of one, but I, I think McDonald's just tried a, a, a VP or executive VP at Oak Brook. That's a question. That's a question. Yeah. Oh. We have a question. Yeah, no, have it's a an observation question. that in one area we'll, we'll we're doing well. We're going to rebuttals. Yes. Thank our speaker.
Started, Andy. Okay. Frank's going to be the first rebutter. And uh, let me have a show of hands, please. Uh, who wants to give a rebuttal tonight? And we'll get a right. Thank you. Very good. Everybody keep your hand up. Yeah, I one over there. Very good. Here, well, three. Andy. Five. With the microphone. Okay, put the microphone back in the thing. Uh, through my uh, brief life here in the United States, so we started or not? We started. Okay. Thank you. Okay. 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 You stop. I, I, I go ahead. Okay. Um, I uh, came in the uh, United States 1963. I started working in the company in Skokie, and uh, I was designing machines and things like that. And I needed some mathematics. Uh, to, to do calculations of the strength of materials, et cetera, et cetera. So I asked the company to hire uh, a person with uh, an engineer or something that uh, have the ability to do these things. So I interviewed a few people, and finally a real good guy came in, and he was perfectly dressed with his briefcase. He was a graduate from IIT. And I started talking with him. I said, Shit, I will learn from this guy. So I told the boss, well, I found the guy. And so he goes and interviews the guy. And then I said, well, we are not going to hire a nigger here. That's what they told me. That was 1965, 63, 65. Uh, so how, how they wasted the resources. Then, uh, I don't know if you know the name Chandrasekhar, he was one of the greatest, greatest astrophysicists, and he was here in Chicago, and nobody offered him to stay over. <laughs> the greatest astrophysicist. He don't have no place to stay overnight when he came to speak at the University of Chicago. Yeah. Now, you know, that, that, that got to tell you something about where we are here. It's very, 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 very sad. And I have a, a few other anecdotes. Uh, I used to befriend a, a black welder. He was a good welder. And uh, so I, I have a little shop, and, and he helped me up. But he couldn't find a job here because he was black. <laughs> he was a wonderful welder, but no jobs in Chicago. So he has to leave Chicago. He said in the in the south they, they call me boy, but they give me a job. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah, pray. Yeah, boy, pray. Just put it on the tape. <clears throat> you want to go behind it? Well, let me get that set up again. Let me get that set up. Well, I hope everybody can hear me. Sometimes I can't hear these things. You lost the Velcro on it. It pops out of there. No, I, I, I know. We, we're, we're gonna. Okay. We'll get it. Leave it there. Just leave, leave, it, leave it there. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, as far as I'm concerned, racism is rampant in the United States and in this audience. No kidding. And I'm a part of that. I don't know uh, that I'm that. Uh, my suggestion, first, uh, thanks to the speaker. I think he did a great job 
if he can face us, he can pretty much face anybody. So uh, I would recommend any of you who consider yourself seniors and want to work on this problem of racism to join Jane Addams Senior Caucus and or Jane Addams Seniors in Action, our 501c4. And you'll learn about health care, you'll learn about housing, you'll learn about economic justice, and yes, you'll hear about racial justice. Uh, Jane Addams Senior Caucus, a couple years ago, sent me to Michigan for a whole week. Uh, was white people working on their own problems. Frankly, I didn't like the course very much, and I didn't ask the uh, executive director why she sent me. I'm afraid she'd tell me. But in any event, uh, if you want to really consider this problem, come to Jane Addams Senior Caucus. We're working on it. I think we're a progressive force and you would be welcome. Thank you. What time? What day? Uh, we're, our next meeting, as I announced during the announcements, is Movement Politics. Movement Politics is a week from Monday. A week from Monday, 11 a.m. at 1111 North Wells. 1111 North Wells, Movement Politics, a week from Monday. You would be welcome. Uh, you don't have to be a member to uh, attend that if we have any decisions to make, and we probably will, uh, you can't vote, but you could join right then and vote. Is that every Monday? That's no. Uh, like we have different times at different places. So uh, believe me, I'm a regular here. I'm not here every week. Once in a while I miss. But I will be here and I will announce every major Jane Adams Senior Caucus and Jane Adams Seniors in Action uh, meeting. There's a, a one two weeks from Monday as well. That'll be the combined health care and housing uh, meeting. And again, uh, people can come there if they're not members. They can join at that time if they feel like it. Uh, and uh, you can uh, participate in the situation. That'll also be 1111 North Wells. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ellen Corley. I, uh, I've been coming here for a few months now, about six times, and. Um, I thank you for the topic. Uh, I'll check on it. What's your last name? Mm. I okay. really enjoy this free speech forum because right. it, get some. I think this is so critical for all of us. Uh, but I guess the thing I want to talk about is a bunch of things. But um, I've got a master's in teaching. I taught in a half uh, black, half white, and an all black school in Atlanta. And then came up here, wasn't able to get into teaching, but I did, uh, um, which has been frustrating. So the, the subject of higher education, I think there's a real barrier in terms of, I have a master's in education and an MBA from UIC, but I can't get in a PhD program. And, um, and so there's barriers I don't really understand. But I went and got a CADC at Kennedy King and Harold Washington, and um, you know, Washington was great, and Kennedy King, I was one of the few white people there, and there was discrimination against me from getting an internship. I would have liked to create internships. I would have liked to have been a leader, but I really did. So, I mean, you come and say these people about your story, they know. If they wanted to do, they wanted to do something, they should have done it. Why, why black people are in a seat hall right now is because white people and these are part of that. And that's a reality. And now what is going to change that? It's not going to change it no matter how many times you tell white people you are racist, they'll agree. And then they go home and, hey, that's the upper one thing, forget about it. The, if you want to change black community, 
you have to understand white people, you have to understand white culture, and do you know something? White culture is a dominant culture in America, and you have to learn and learn, and how they live, how they think, how they work, you have to copy, you have to understand that, and you have to teach your people that, look, this is the way they think, this is the way they work, this is the way they manage their money, this is the way they manage their family, and then it might work. And don't take the worst of them. There are lots of good, good white men and white women and white families. And take example from them. I do not, I do not think what what you are saying. And I, when I talk about a wedding, it tells me a lot. You do not know much about white people. You do not care much about white people. I I see your modern modern way thing. Okay? And, and I know you're talking about black prison, that thing. And I know you don't, you just, I don't know whether you care or not, but you haven't learned. You're not telling, you're not telling a black student to, hey, learn white people. Okay? Learn, learn African. Do you know when Nigerian, Nigerian or Kenyan used to come to my store? I feel at home. I never thought they were black. No, I, I, I had 3,000. 3,000 account of black people in my oh store, 3,000. There's many, as many people I want to and talk and deal with day after day after day, okay? And, I, and do you know something? You still feel, but you do not feel that with the Africans. You never feel that with the Africans. And then there, there is something for you to learn, learn that. What, how can we learn more from Africans? I had an African Nigerian woman come, man brought a Nigerian mother, mother in my store. And I say, hey, what do, you, what do you think about a nice nice black girl for your son? They say, not American black. Can I do my rebuttal? No, you can, you can, you can, you will have time, you will have time. My time is over, you have time. Okay, but what, 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 what I'm saying is that, what, what, what I'm saying is that, I'm, I'm, I'm not looking for argument. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to say, that which way is the solution? Which way is the better future for black? Okay, thank you. took the money for which a lot of taxpayers are African-American and historically also suffered more from TBIs from fighting our wars and of that only 10% was willing to stay in somewhat group the groups that we took the money for this is quite recent data and let me tell you the number of us that remain four now why did that happen that happened because there was no cultural congruity because there was no Dean that represented our community and this is in the face of people that are shot regularly in Chicago. So what we're really talking about is the role of government to help when there's minimal protection of minority voice. It's the fact that African Americans are only 12% of the culture and have not had enough voice. That is a fact. And it is still happening in the 21st century. So until you make that better with voter rights laws, until you get your attorneys out, until you know what's going on, what will happen? African Americans will still be blown away at domestic level as well as international level. That is blood on the handle of the majority, and that is a fact. My husband actually has been here longer than anybody else <laughs> as an attendant at this. Um, and thank you very much for your presentation. It's very well organized. You are a diplomat. You certainly, I would have said other things in answer to the questions that you were asked. Um, and, I, and I appreciate your diplomacy. Um, uh, 
what Jean said about the the audience that that racism is 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 inherent in our society. It's absolutely true, and it's absolutely true in this room. And I certainly have become more and more aware of it, um, even in my own reactions and in my own self and my own history, because um, that's just true. That's all. Then there's just, a, and then I just want to do a small. Um, historical thing, right after the Civil War they opened Freedmen schools because as you as he as you said, the the teaching uh, a slave or even teaching a black person, an African, to read was illegal. So some people learned illegally, Frederick Douglass for one, um, and um, but after the after the Civil War there were Freedmen schools, and the teachers in the Freedmen schools were generally white spinsters who came down to the South and taught. And um, and they didn't just teach black children; they taught uh, illiterate white children. I saw a picture of a Freedmen school in New Orleans that half of the students were white children. So illiteracy was pretty was a big problem here after the Civil War, all over the place. But in some places. Um, white children could go to the Freedmen schools. Um, and I guess uh, the after, after the uh, slavery, after Jim Crow and all of those Confederate monuments, in fact, were built in the 1880s and 1890s after the Reconstruction was ended legally and the withdrawal of Union troops from the um, from the South, who were enforcing voting rights and all of that, Jim Crow was then enacted, which took away voting rights, took away people's rights to education and rights to a living, and um, the lynching started, and um, the repression started again. And after the Jim Crow laws then eventually got repealed, and now we have things like the, the, the school to prison pipeline, where we have incarceration of, uh, of people, and, and you mentioned that. And, um, and so, you know, this, the, the racism and, and all of this continues. So, um, in terms of the schools, I do think that, in, well, specifically in Chicago, the community segregation, which uh, results in segregated schools and the, uh, the lack of city uh, getting resources into schools that are segregated, is really, is in fact one of the problems. And uh, for example, uh, before they closed all those schools, there were something like 50 schools, including high schools, that did not have school libraries. And with this last few years, with all the budget cuts, one of the positions that went was the school librarian. So you, have, you may have had libraries, but you didn't have a librarian to run the library. So that all of these uh, non-essential positions like librarian and reading teacher and math teacher and science teacher that were enriching the curriculum um, were cut because that's what you did and you cut things like special education and stuff like that. So people really ended up on the wrong end of the lollipop stick, that's for sure. So um, the, 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 the endemic systemic racism of the structure of this city is responsible for a great deal of the of the problems <coughs> that African American people face now. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm not going to go up Andy. I'm not going to go. Yes. That's <laughs> your rush. You know, the mere fact that we're talking about this stuff and doing it openly gives me hope for this country. You know, a lot of people have just concentrated on the negative that this country has. When in reality, 
we've seen a great level of success in this country and around the world. There's a recent book out by a gentleman by the name of Johan, um, I'm sorry, he's a Swedish economist. And he talks, and his book just basically goes through the numbers of how successful we are getting around the world. Most of the world is now, there's less than 10% of our population on ab worldwide on abject poverty, less than a dollar a day, when in 1990 it was almost a third. You look today, our lifespans are a lot longer than they ever have been. It's, you know, 50 years ago, 60, 55 was common worldwide. Now we're starting to see that it's been lengthening due to our medical systems improving. And yes, even violence is down amongst the world. Now we've had some anomalies with the uh, dictatorships that have been piling up, like uh, in the Middle East. But if all you're gonna get is a steady diet of what is wrong, which is what our news is, and it's been around for hundreds of years, as I said, if it bleeds, it leads. That's what uh, William Randolph Hearst said for ratings. And we see the same thing today in our 24-hour news cycle. For example, there are several African states that are really being ran very well, but you won't hear about them. You know, look what happened in South Africa after apartheid was solved and Mandela came in and some of the administrations, you're not going to hear about it. Central Kazakhstan, for example, has been prospering with its oil wealth and spending the money a little more wisely than a lot of the other states. You're not going to hear about it. I would highly say that we are in a much better time today as human beings than we've ever seen in history. You think we've got problems? Yes, we do have problems. But yes, we're starting to solve some of those problems. You know, the one thing that encourages me about the black people and the discrimination is that, you know, if you consider it, you've only been full citizens for the last maybe 50 years since the granting of the Civil Rights Act. And, you know, maybe you weren't chosen to become here, but there's a lot of you advancing in society. I think 30% or more are joining the middle class. A lot of them are enjoying that American success story. You know, and there's 70% there's still left to go, but I think it's going to change. I think it's really going to change. You know, we take a look at what happened with um, gay marriage. Five, six years ago, it was uh, something else. Now we're inclusive. I don't exactly agree with it with my Christian background, but that's another story. I use that more as an example of how fast things can change. The thing about this world that we have to remember is that we're moving faster, <coughs> quicker, and have to adapt a lot more faster than we've ever been. And I think as human beings, we're just not quite used yet to that rate of change and that adapt adaptability. We are living longer. Some of us will have maybe two or three careers. And yes, there does need to be some kind of social safety net. I hope to expand upon this further at my talk in Thanksgiving, is Trump another, a, 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 tr a, a true capitalist or just another mooch in the corporate trough? Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for the award. Yeah. You'd be stupid not to attend. Yeah, I would be stupid, but I would have to say something. I would be wise. <laughs> All right, just to sum up, my, Mr. Uh, DeWitt, DeWitt did a uh, great favor to me because I live optimistically. Instead of uh, a litany of grievances and some of the things that we're awash in uh, on public media and television, he comes in talking about an historical anomaly, really, tonight, and how we've managed to flip it over, I think. and and, and uh, uh, Colleges used to be, uh, and, the, and their purposes were uh, to create a good old boys, boys network, a network that will move on to run major institutions, corporations, banks, uh, this kind of thing. Um, this will change, and it is changing. And when I think of our local situation, 
um, Malcolm X down the street from me now is a major powerhouse. And when I thought 10 years ago it would be gone or folded into something else, it's now a pre-medical college. Um, Chicago State University, very few know uh, from the news you hear in the media glossing over, that it has a major pharmacy school filling places like Walgreens, CBS, Abbott Labs. Um, that's where they're headed. And so um, it's not about retrogression, but progression. And um, you know, we used to do things like all-girls schools and all-boys schools. At Notre Dame now and St. Mary's are practically brother, sister uh, at South Bend uh, colleges because they realize there's more in heterogeneity than separation walls and uh, hedgerows between those colleges. Uh, I think of Mundelein. Uh, I regret Mundelein was completely folded into Loyola, but uh, there's more heterogeneity again as men and women learn to learn, uh, integrate and benefit from it as we will from black, Latino, Asian, and white colleges uh, to advance. Um, I'm even thinking of the unusual idea of Chicago State as a 150-year-old predominantly, uh, well, teacher's college, not PPI or PWI, but starting as a teacher's college in a boxcar on the south side. And also the uh, odd idea that when they established their first black president, all the board uh, was white. Sort of like, well, we'll, we'll, we'll like the black president, but we'll remain, uh, be sure the whites are the trustees in power. And now what we have, to my surprise, at that school, just as my surprise over Malcolm X, is we have a white president, don't we? We have a Greek uh, American, a white president, and a flip side, black board of trustees. So let's see what comes of that. So fasten your seat belts because I think the new colleges of tomorrow will be like nothing you ever saw in the past or were imagined at that good old boys network or sister, seven sister schools or the Ivies. It'll never be the same. Thanks to it for bringing that up. Charlie, you're the last one. the last. Oh, great. Second to last. All right. Let's thank our speaker for a very nice, really, he did uh, put together a well constructed, um, well, uh, I mean, a well constructed presentation. I'll be eclectic and quick. Um, someone is asking me about the history of the college and we've just seen the last of the original generation there's still one left um, it, the college incorporated veterans of the civil rights movement specifically uh, Quinn Brisbane and, and Brown Basford who went down south the Freedom School and were arrested, and Kay Myers uh, were very much involved in the Civil Rights Movement. And I heard many interesting stories and accounts of their engagement in various uh, activities advancing civil rights here. Um, a jumper again to academia, I've been involved in the contingent academic labor issue. Academia is a management element that seemingly operates under its own rules and isn't going to be receptive to anybody who comes in and uh, suggests anything otherwise. They're a pretty tenacious group. Um, there's been some disputes about representing uh, the employees of universities that send the news sporadically. Uh, my friend Joe was, and still is, very central figure um, in, in that organizing effort and ongoing thing. The last thing I will mention, though, and we didn't talk about it tonight, and before you jump on my friend Raj, 
Uh, the thing that really intrigues me, though, when it wasn't the topic tonight, is where is the president of the United States regarding racism? <laughs> and this whole yeah. black lives thing. <laughs> and I have any number of right-wing people who forward me things on Facebook about patriotic uh, actions and kneeling and there's no KKK. We saw a little bit here in a slideshow. There seems to be a resurgent movement here and what's going on. And the other thing that kind of bothers me is the only, being a federal employee, the only ranking black cabinet official is this guy Carson. Yeah. I'm sorry, he's not very representative. No, 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 no. <laughs> substance in it. Just, I, I just couldn't imagine working in that agency. I just, I just, I just I'd walk around, I just couldn't figure out. He's kind of like his own secretary. But anyhow, there are some serious things cooking here. And I think that Trump is fostering this stuff. It started during the campaign, and it seems to be growing and not lessening. And he doesn't want, it seems to even taken the focal point of his issues to the point where other things are put aside. You know, he's kind of talking about this constantly, you know, to the expense of other topics that take precedence. Hey, now, thanks again to Whit for coming again. And you got another one. Your turn, Andy. Let's give our neighbor speaker a hand of applause. Hey. As I remarked before, uh, my name is Andy Anderson, and uh, I have a hobby of translating books from a wheelbarrow full of paper, 10, 15 books into a one-page summary or cliff notes that somebody can read in five minutes. Um, I spent a part of the last two days rereading some books that were published 25 to 30 years ago on what the scientists were saying about the AIDS epidemic. And uh, it's amazing to look back and see how some of the scientists in 1987, 88, 89, they got it right. Uh, who in this audience knows about the Tuskegee experiment. Yeah. I, if you interview almost any African American that had a grandparent in this country knows about that. But a lot of Caucasian people don't know about it. Well, uh, how many people have heard of the, doc the African American doctor Nancy Turner Banks? Does that name ring a bell? Yeah. You know, did you read her book? How do you know her? She was mentioned a few times in my black studies class. Nancy Turner Banks is an African-American doctor. She published one of the best books. Hello? I'll just hold on. I'm having a conference in the back. Nancy Turner Banks uh, published a book that she was the first doctor, and she's African-American, to point out that the chemicals they used to make the HIV test were front-loaded to react to African-American blood 500% more likely than Caucasian or Asian blood. Now, I reported this 10 years ago, and a couple people got up out of the audience and left because they couldn't handle the reality. You may have noticed tonight that we have people in the audience that for the last 25 years have been standing in a blizzard of evidence claiming they can't see a single snowflake. I recently, there's an article on the internet, a 20-page article uh, by Frances T. Schur, a, a psychiatrist. She published this 20-page, uh, each one of them was about 20 pages. It's a book on one of the 9-11 sites. And the title of that is, Why Do Good People Go Silent or Worse When You Try to Talk About the Subject of 9-11? Some people cannot face the reality that exists on certain subjects, sure. especially subjects that are blacked out by the mainstream media. I'm a VA uh, Vietnam veteran, so I, I went down you know, to get an annual checkup with the VA. The VA is now testing, Disagree. one of the things Disagree. they're testing veterans for, or all veterans over 60, is HIV screening. Well, what segment of our public, what segment of the population 
Could a drug company target where you can have the government pay for their medication? Veterans get medication for free, right? So if, if you're HIV negative, but they think you might be exposed to a drug user or something or whatever, if you're at risk, you can sign up to take one pill a day that will supposedly keep you safe, and that costs $1,800 a month for a bottle of 30 pills. So they're in the phase two of the AIDS epidemic is starting where they're going to use veterans as human ATM machines. A veteran will sign up, they'll sign up to take a pill a day to keep safe, and government taxpayer, all of our money will be funneled through that veteran into the bank accounts of one of the billionaire predators that owns a drug company that makes that pill. So we are, as I've appointed, Censored News, uh, I've talked about this for years, Censored News, the book is coming out this Tuesday, the 2018 edition. It has the top 25 blacked out stories in it that would change America overnight if they were covered rather than blacked out. One of the censored stories they've been covering for years is the fact that there's no infectious AIDS epidemic. The test is bogus. It doesn't test for the virus. They censored news covered extensively for six, seven years the myth of 9-11. We puncture these myths and you can bring the troops home. There's thousands of troops, hundreds of thousands of troops in our military. They have, I don't know how many hundreds of helicopters. We should have troops, helicopters, uh, the personnel carriers where they can land on the beaches. All that stuff should be down in Port, you know, helping Puerto Rico, right? Not over in Afghanistan and Iraq slaughtering women and children to keep, uh, protect the oil fields of Dick Cheney's oil buddies. We, if we're going to wake up and change happens when people reach critical mass and say enough is enough, we have billionaire predators right now, billionaire, billionaire killers, billionaire predators, billionaire vultures running the government of the United States. That's not a statement of you know, any kind of opinion. It's a collective summary of what you would call thousands of elders of society that are publishing articles every day on the good websites that have the best of the best news. You got a question, Charlie? Andy, just the other day, seriously, I, I saw on the headline there are 25,000 people diagnosed with HIV or AIDS in the city of Chicago. Yes, uh, to answer exactly. Charlie's question, they, uh, if you were, the articles, uh, they, uh, two or three people or four people a year die or die or of AIDS. Three or four or five die in Sweden or the others. The United States is the last major country in the world that is using the bogus HIV test, which doesn't test for HIV. It classifies people positive when they're sick for almost anything. So the idea is to keep classifying 15, 20,000 people here positive to have a base of customers, consumers, for the AIDS done? trucks. It's, it's considered the largest, costliest right. branch. It's the largest, costliest, most embarrassing medical mistake in U.S. or world history. Okay. And th this is it. So, uh, you know, we, we've got, last thing I'll say, uh, we're coaching seventh graders. We teach seventh graders that in order to solve any right. problem, you must first correctly acknowledge and recognize the problem. You have to correctly identify the problem, not stand in a blizzard with rose-colored glasses on saying you can't see a single snowflake, which is what we get here every, every week on certain subjects. And it varies from week to week, person to person. Yeah. So uh, let our speaker come up and give a rebuttal. And uh, oh, thank you for your rebuttal. Yeah. The speaker gets the last word. OK, thank you. Thank you. Well, well, why don't you stay behind it? Uh, that way we can get you up one in there. So uh, first off, I know it's getting late and everyone is ready to go. Uh, so I, I, I'll promise to be brief. Uh, thank you all, first off, for having me. I really appreciate this. I didn't know what to expect coming, but I'm glad I came. <laughs> Come back. Come back, please. This is the absolute pleasure. Um, I think... Um, I, I think the conversation tonight is, okay. is was really good because it's necessary, right? We're living in a country that's very divisive right now, uh, based on racial lines, and it's getting more and more—not just racial, but cultural, religious, uh, uh, sexual orientation—all the, the same. Um, so, the more times that we can have people from different backgrounds have honest conversations back and forth with one another, I think that's a plus. That's the only way we're going to get forward. Honest engagement with one another. 
or, 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 and we see things differently. Be honest, be straightforward, be candid, whatever your questions or, or thoughts may be. Um, uh, to, to, just to my last point, my rebuttal to my brother uh, Raj, is your, is your name? Yeah, Raj. Yes. Um, uh, Raj made a few comments, uh, a few interesting, colorful comments. Um, I know you had said that um, you don't think I care for white people. Or, so you said something like that, right? Yes. I, I don't care for white people. And I, you know. Now he asked me a question during the presentation. Of, uh, what do I think about white people? And I told him I believe that the large majority of white people are good, honest, hardworking people that want the best for everyone. I think that racism among white culture is very small, very in the minority. So now if you, if you ask me that, Raj, and I tell you that, but you come behind me and you say that I don't care for, for white people. No, I don't come behind you. I got back to well, I'm, I'm going after, after I spoke, you spoke, right? Okay. Okay. So if you come after me and say I don't care about white people, but I just told you that I think white people are honest, well-meaning, hardworking people that want the best for everything, there's nothing more I can do, right? I mean, I can just, I get it if I tell you that and then you tell me something different. Right. And you make that comment based on a 10-minute video for my wedding. No. <laughs> <laughs> my, I, 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 I spent about eight hours, you know. Yeah, absolutely, all right? But, no, no, more than video. What, what the, uh, more than really. <laughs> Some uh, blog you need, you want to put us and why? Okay. I, I, I try to read every day I get for you. Have you ever had a conversation with me? No. So it, it's very tough for you to surmise. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying you're a bad guy, okay? Right, okay. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just expressing yeah. my opinion. Right, exactly. Well, and I'm, I'm telling you, I'm, so I'm telling you why your opinion is wrong. Uh, <laughs> so if, if you never had a conversation Fine, somebody with somebody tell the son of a bitch. <laughs> if, you, if you never had a conversation with me, if you never sat down and, and, and able to engage me, right? You never come out to meet me. We never. I, I've never met you before today, right? It's tough for you to 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 form an opinion of who I am, right? Based on a 10-minute video and a 20-minute talk. That's very. I mean, I think that's irresponsible, right? I would. I could never. Form an opinion on you, right? Based on, and I never met you, never had a conversation with you. That's what we do here. Okay. okay. <laughs> right. And, and 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 to the last point, um, I think you mentioned you mentioned about uh, the need for black people to study white people, to do what white people do, right? And I would ask, just just I would ask, what uh, what country are you from? Sure. India. India. That's exactly what I need. Right, exactly, right. You're from I India. I'm from India. I, I, I study white people. I, did not, I study Jewish people. Well, I'll let you speak, so you can let me speak. Okay. Right. You're from India. What country am I from? America. Okay, right. Do I look, eh, yeah. What country are my ancestors from? I don't know. Neither do I. What's your religion? What's your native religion? I don't have no religion. Okay, because I don't know what mine is. Right. Uh, What's your native language? Native language, right? English. I've been here 15 years. Uh, your ancestors? 15 years. So oh. I don't know my language now anymore. Oh, and, okay, and neither do I. So, with your, uh, the point that I'm getting to, your idea to study white people, I don't know who I am. I'm not trying to, I'm not, not, not trying to be argument with you. Right. I, just, I, just, I just stated my opinion as a part of the dialogue here. I, I understand. Yeah. I, well, <laughs> well, my goal now is to show you why you're wrong. Right? So, yeah. I think I should study myself first. Okay. Before I study anyone else, right? Okay, you are entitled to do whatever you want to do, whatever uh, you want to say. I, 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 and I'm saying it now, okay. right? To study, since first grade, U.S. history is a common requirement, right? That's white history, right? So I'm, we've been studying white, black people, we've been studying white culture since we were small, right? That's all we have, TV, white culture, music, white culture, media, white culture, right? We study white people daily, on a daily basis. We have no choice. This is what we have. I just want to know what you Describe how you think about white people, okay? And I told you, but you came back and said something okay, different. Okay, I agree. Okay, if you say it, and uh, you say it, I say okay, right. I take it. I understand. Okay. Right, All right, stuff. Cubs or Sox uh, fan? Uh, Absolute Sox fan, Southside. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Thank you all. I appreciate it. Thank you. Get my shot. See you, George. Sorry, just forget it. Thank you for coming. Thank you. <laughs>